uh, this is going to be the beginning of part number three. Uh, part number three of John Doyle's How Porn is Destroying You and Our Country, um, The Effects of the Addiction. Um, and just for those of you who might be watching on YouTube, uh, if you want to, uh, we have the other videos uh, available. They might be on your sidebar right now. If not, they're in the videos section. Um, uh, we did part one and part two as well. But uh, right now we are live in real life. And so for those of you live with me right now, let's let's continue to take this ride. <laughs> it's a dickathon. It's a dickathon. So our entire frame of reference for sexuality has been established for us in the form of mass produced, mass marketed super stimuli that exist to addict you for the profit of a select few. It's warping our sexual desires. I do agree in the capitalization of of sex being a a probably a negative on how we stigmatize sexuality but but John Doyle saying it's bad and then doing the thing that's bad about it is the problem right so so the, 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 the is this real life or is this just a dickathon it's a dickathon uh so the problem with with so a hypersexual society such as I would say and I think the aces in chat would agree and most people would agree in general uh the United States um definitely from a marketing perspective is hypersexual um, we're even hypersexual outside of marketing spaces, but it's kind of due to that where we've sold sex as, as a thing, um, that, I mean, sells us products. Uh, it, 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 it like whether it's smoking and it makes you look sexy, Axe body spray, fucking, fucking, uh, uh beer commercials, pizza, fucking, uh, Whataburger, not Whataburger, the fucking, um, uh, 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 what's the, what's the, what's, what's the burger place out West? That has the fries. <laughs> you know the one. Uh, not Hardee's. Is it Hardee's that did the... Oh, Carl's Jr. and Hardee's. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, uh, they did the uh, big sexy uh, commercials uh, where the Bazonga people eat the eat the beef uh, burgers. Um, sexy, what a burger. Literally a lot of commercials are like this. Um, so the problem isn't that uh, people are now addicted to sex because of this. No, 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 no. Uh, the problem is that we... we, we Talk about sex in a way that doesn't involve consent a lot. And that leads to obvious, obviously like predation and victimization of people uh, from a sexual perspective, which is not a good thing. It also just unhealthy sex expectations. Um, uh, the way that we engage with sexuality can sometimes be bad, but it's not what we're doing in our own homes, like alone, that tend to be the bad aspects of this. Um, a couple things. First of all, obviously, we just talked about it uh, uh, in the, at the end of part two. Um, the The idea that being a virgin is like a bad thing, right? If you are not ready to have sex, or you haven't found someone that wants to consent with you, or you just you just haven't I don't know there might be like a like a social issue. Maybe you are nervous about it. Um, there's a lot of pressure. I have a friend, a very very good friend from high school, who. Um, I don't know if he's had sex yet. He's my age. Um, uh, he hadn't last time we'd spoken. Um, and uh, we're not super close anymore, but I'd like to be. Uh, that sounded worse, <laughs> more sexual than I imagine. Um, uh, he's a really good friend. He's a good looking guy. We t I've talked about this before. He's a really good looking guy. He's successful. He just gets very nervous um, when it comes to that, that sort of thing in relationships. And it frustrates him quite a bit. Um, and so, like, like, I, I have empathy for that. Um, uh, it's it's it could be it could be rough, and um, so I don't know. There, there's there's just a lot of ways that uh, there's a lot of ways that that manifests. Uh, there's also slut shaming, which is huge, which is like the opposite end of the spectrum. You either don't have enough sex, or you have too much sex. Like there's always something wrong with how somebody's having sex. It's always something bad. the The exact amount that you have consensual sex is the correct amount, probably. Um, from a health perspective, insofar as society is concerned, who gives a shit, right? Who gives a shit? Um, if you, however you want to fuck or don't want to fuck is the proper way, all right? Assuming it involves consent. Even in cases where there's, there's simulated, like, consensual non-consent, if that makes sense, which I'm not going to, you know, use any of the verbiage that you would for need for that, but, um... Really? Uh, you, you understand what I'm talking about. There was a big thing with, um, with, um, uh, I forget her name. Uh, Bella Delphine did a consensual non-consent video recently and there was a big discourse about it. Um, 
Yeah, I, yeah, yeah. Or Bell, Bell, not Bella, Bell, Bell. My bad. Um, <clears throat> so yeah, I just whatever, whatever you got going on is the correct thing, dude. Um, if you have a fetish that would otherwise be uncouth, um, as long as you're getting consent from whoever you engage that with, that is a hundred percent fine, and you shouldn't feel shame for it. Um, Illuminal, wait, Illuminivtig. What? Thanks <laughs> for following. Um, it's because it was pedo bait. Yeah, sure, I, I, I guess. But again, we're not going to talk about the the discourse because I I literally do not care if you if again you can you can have consensual non consent with adults where one person uh, uh, has a uh, particularly um, young aesthetic. It's it's not something I'm into, but it's something that if two people consent to is fine. So, again, I don't have a problem with it. Um, uh, but uh, you don't have to be for it um, in general. My husband was 34 before he, had, he first had sex. He's really disrespectful and low sex drive. Yeah, that's fine. A lot of people have low sex drives. Um, that's fine, too. A reminder to everyone that sex is in porn is framed to look appealing to the viewer, not the pleasure of those involved. What is enjoyable for you may not be different. Was yeah, of course. That's what we talked about that earlier. Um, yeah, um, age play is a thing. Yes, not a fan, but it is a thing. Yeah, and it's fine. And there's some people who age play goes the other way, where they're 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 really like they people have um, uh, sort of a fetish for for older people. So you know, um, yeah. It's warping our sexual preferences. It's literally making us depressed, as we've discussed. It's making us less attracted to real women. It gives us erectile dysfunction, and it's only going to get worse. There's no trend that would suggest that it gets better because nobody's talking about this. No one wants to take action because everyone's addicted to it. Even back in 2004, as early as 2004, almost 20 years ago, there was a study done by Swedish researchers that found that 99% of young men had consumed pornography and that more than half of, of them felt that it had an impact on their sexual behavior. Fast forward to 2016, sure. we have data that shows that 49% of men report viewing pornography that was not previously interesting to them or that they once even considered to be, quote, disgusting. Well, yeah, of course, because <laughs> this has to do with normalization, and I know he's against that, which is fine. Uh, at least it's consistent. Um, it's about normalization of, 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 of sex. Like, we literally are talking about it. Like, the, the conversation we're having is something that he's very, very abjectly against, right? Um when when we say something like, "Hey, however you want to, however you get off is is valid and fine as long as there's consent involved," he does not like that. He does not. He's not enjoy it. There's some things that are devious and and uh, in his own words, degenerate and uh, unhealthy for you to engage in. Um, like like there are people um, either they're radical feminists or they're hyper conservative. It's usually the only two of those. And usually, if you're a radical feminist um, and you have this take, the sex negative take. You're wrong and stupid. Um, I sort of squeaked there. Uh, you're wrong and stupid. Um, <clears throat> those are the same thing. I usually agree with you. I tend to agree with you, yes. Um, so they're at, least, they're at best neoliberal. Um, the idea that, like, like pain can't be part of your, 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 your sex, like, if you draw blood. Like, I'm not into it, but if you are, I don't care. It's consent. Um uh, again, um, things that would otherwise be uncool, being tied up, uh, uh, doing the tying up, uh, we're getting sort of more closer to reality for your boy. Um, things like, um, I don't know, uh, being very submissive or being very dominant, obviously. Um, although I don't know why a conservative would be against that situation because they think that the specifically men should be in charge all the time. Um, <laughs> You know, there, there's lots of different ways this can manifest in a way that would, if 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 the two people weren't fully consenting to the situation, could absolutely a hundred percent be seen as uncool. But if you want someone to take a fucking paddle and in 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 crush your ass cheek with it, then fucking get it, dude. Get after it. I want you to be fucking like like I want you to whatever you got going on. In your life, hopefully you are sexually healthy enough and 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 stable enough in whatever relationships you have, whether it's a long term relationship or or a, a casual one, whatever is going on, um, to communicate your sexual needs and to get what you need 
out of of an interaction of sexual nature with any other person. That is ideal, right? That's really what the whole thing is. Everybody consenting to everybody else's shit and getting the exact maximal sort of positive experience out of it they can. Even if that involves what would otherwise be a negative experience. Cock and ball torture is a very common joke on here. Some people genuinely like to have their balls punched. I'm not into that. I am into other very... If you're very kind to my balls, boy, do I like that. But if you're going to punch me in the balls, I'm going to disengage, right? That's not my consent. So if you... Like, like it just it just has to be with with, with different things. I mean, I, I, I don't understand... I don't understand how you could be against consenting adults doing things. I also don't understand how you could be against an individual watching consenting adults doing things. Because that can also be your thing. I don't know. Uh, yes, get my balls a drink. Uh, make sure that they are um, like comfy and snug. Yes. What's more is that fully 20% of them admitted to using pornography to, quote, maintain arousal with my partner. You see the problem there? You understand what's wrong with that? Using the artificial to which you have warped and grounded your desires in order to successfully partake in the natural and the real. Think about this for a second, and please don't answer aloud. And again, there's no shame in this. I'm definitely going to answer aloud. In some capacity. But just think to yourself about the most okay. repulsive thing that you've ever gotten off to. I know you know what it is, and I know that you know that it's wrong in a clear mind. Now I'm trying to think of the most rep I don't think of anything that I've ever gotten off to as repulsive. I don't know. Like, what, what, I didn't, cause he, he framed it in a way that I don't know. <coughs> I don't know what that would be. Um, <laughs> I mean, probably situations where there's more than two people involved. Like, I, I maybe that's what he would think is bad. I don't know. I I can't I can't imagine he'd think that non monogamous sex was was good. So yeah, that might be it. I don't know. Now think about how tragic it is that there are people making money off getting 11-year-old boys to watch the same type of stuff, or even more repulsive stuff. It's not about 11-year-old boys. <laughs> Jesus Christ. Think about whether you've ever had to use pornography to sustain yourself while having sex with your partner. Do you I understand the problem with that? Do you understand why that's wrong? And you know, we'll talk more about this when we get into the societal effects of this stuff. To sustain yourself. But I want you to just be thinking about that as we... To stay hard is what he's saying, by the way. Go along, because recognizing the degree to which this problem exists or has manifested in your life is keystone to solving it and liberating yourself from it. And with young people, I want to get back to what we talked about earlier with neurons that fire together, wire together, and the association between sexual arousal and the other... 11-year-old boys have money? No. I mean, I think he's talking about ad revenue on, like, Pornhub or something? Jason Factors, because one of the most important things that happens to us as we go through puberty um, and our brains are still developed... Water bondage? Wait, what's what specifically is water bondage? What? I don't want to watch it. I just want to see it. Oh, where you're underwater or near water? Like in a tub or a pool? That seems like it could be dangerous. I've never... These don't, these don't get me going. I'm not into that. Yeah, I'm not into waste play or anything like that. Breath breath play with water feels scary. Um, but I, I'm assuming that's the point for some people. But um, uh, I understand like like choking and stuff because that's more controllable. I don't know. I just breath play is is something that is pretty pretty dangerous um, when it comes to uh, uh, you know <laughs> safety involved. Uh, obviously, you're going to have to have uh, pretty experienced people there. And frankly, um, doing doing so in a group seems to make a lot more sense. Water up. At, that's just an enema, isn't it? I don't know. Um, just breathe for it, idiot. <laughs> Developing until we're like 24, 25, is that we both consciously and unconsciously learn about sex. And part of how this is accomplished is by your brain wiring to respond to sexual cues in your environment. And adolescents wire together these experiences with arousal much faster and much more easily than young adults do, despite an age difference of only a few years. And teenagers are especially vulnerable because their entire reward circuitry is basically just an overdrive the whole time. And as a result of that, they experience an exaggerated version of the cycle that we discussed earlier, which means that they experience higher spikes of dopamine, but also they become bored more easily. And this is because they are more yes. sensitive to dopamine and they also produce more Delta Fos B. So because the adolescent brain is overly sensitive to reward, it is much more vulnerable to addiction. Yeah, but they seek it out, dude. Like, like it's not like, I would agree that there was a problem with porn in this way 
if it was like adults going up to teenage kids and being like, hey, you seen the latest Pornhub video? You ever see um, Salad? Was it Salad Fingers? Oh, no, no, no. There was this video. I could, I, I think I can show it to you. Uh, it's a, it's a, hold on, it's fucking, st this video right here, this is, this is, this is what I'm thinking of when I, when I, when I, when I think of, like, how John Doyle views, um, this kind of thing, I guess I'll do this, uh, it's just a little 50 second thing from Sick Animation that's, like, fucking old, it's old. Have you seen this before? If you've not seen this before, you're in for a treat, because this is one of the funniest things when I was when I was a teenager, this was so fucking funny to me. But this is like this is like <laughs> on the level of this. I'm not gonna play the whole thing. I'm not gonna play the video. I'll just play the beginning. But, hey, how's it going, you guys? Hey, you guys, Luke. crack your dick. What What you say? You know, like crack your dick. All the teenagers are doing it. <laughs> what are you talking about, man? You know, like like crack your dick. You know, like when you when it's hard and you cr you crack it. No, I can. Ah, honestly... come on. Look, watch, I'll show you. Do you want to fuck? Do you want to fuck tonight? <laughs> anyway, so he sings a little bit of a song, and that's. <laughs> That's what I think of when John Doyle says that. Like, there's not like adults going over here, like, you guys want to crack your dick? Like, that's not happening. I mean, it does happen a little bit, but not, you know, I mean, there are predators out there. Don't let me, don't let me say otherwise. But that's not like the problem of porn, right? The the problem of porn, it's, 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 kids are seeking this out themselves when they have these hormonal, uh, uh, sort of, I mean, look, when you're, when you're fucking, between, between like, the puberty years, eleven to roughly eighteen, you are a volcano of of fuck juice, right? And I mean, in, in the brain aspect, your brain is just like, I want to fuck, I want to fuck, I want to fuck, I want to fuck, like all the time, like like when you're when you're a sexual person, right? When you're not ace or something, and even so, I know that ace people go through um, uh, horniness and stuff sometimes. So, uh, right? It's just it's just like. And that can pervade through life. Like, don't get me wrong, I still I still like it, but I can control myself, right? I'm an adult. I'm not thinking about it as much as I thought about it when I was a teenager, that's for sure. Um, I do go through phases, though. Uh, a volcano, yes. A volcano of fuck juice. Uh, literally, your brain is just like, trying to fuck all the time, every time, all the time, always. Um, it's just... They seek it out, dude. They seek it out. It being available is just a response to a consumer base under capitalism that you approve of. Like, let's be real, dude. Part of the problem of this is the profit motive. Uh, but we would we would still have porn even if there wasn't profit motive because people like to fucking film themselves, man. Anyway, a juicy fuck Kano. Hell yeah. And the scary thing about that is that your brain as an adolescent neurochemically urges you to define sex by whatever offers the biggest buzz, so to speak, which is why the effects of pornography are not the same on adolescents and adults. And this is confirmed by brain scans from a Cambridge study in 2014. Because Cambridge? Basically, your brain naturally sculpts itself to narrow a teen's choices by the time they reach adulthood. And this is because the nerve connections in your brain are governed by a fairly straightforward policy of like use it or lose it, which allows your responses to life to be well honed theoretically. And this is why after you reach about 12, um, your brain actually like shrinks because billions of nerve connections are pruned and reorganized. But the point is that as a teenager, you can literally condition pornography to be your entire sexual frame of reference. You can do this so easily, and you've probably already done it to a certain extent, such that real sex with a real woman can actually feel like a weird experience to you. Or a real anybody else. Just a real person. I Again, I know he's always going to frame this as he heterosexual, procreative type sex. Um, yeah, it's a, that's an, I was just about to say that. Thank you. Encrade? Uh, Encrade? Creed? Encrade? Um, it is an education issue. This is a problem with people not understanding sexuality, it being stigmatized, and um, uh, your boy John here is part of the problem, obviously. Uh, he's not talking about sexual education here. He's not talking about comprehensive uh, uh, sexual education with, with a focus on consent. He is talking about just 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 deny your your urges and uh, and uh, you know be, be like a fucking monk or something like. 
our brains are the way they are for a reason. It's it's we're 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 evolved creatures. We're imperfect, and that's okay. And I understand that, like in the pursuit of of betterment, it might be good to suppress your urges from time to time. It's not always appropriate to want to have sex at every time. Absolutely true. However, it's also not bad to want to have sex. It's fine, uh, just as long as you're not doing it out of uh, out of uh, you know, a self harmy sort of way, uh, you're being safe, and there's consent involved. I have no fucking problem uh, with that. Fuck you, I'm getting railed at a Kinko's. I think, I think it'd be much harder for you to find a Kinko's than get railed at one. <laughs> don't you get blue ball or something if you don't jack off for a long time? Uh, are you not a ball haver, Yolg? We've talked about this twice so far. Uh, yes, it, it, it is a biological imperative as someone that has balls. Uh, for the most part. Uh, I'm sure there are exceptions, but f- most people's experience that have balls are like, yeah, well, there's, <laughs> looks like that there. Reservoir's filled up. Time to not have that anymore. Uh, we, we, we've said it's it, it's akin to hunger pangs and um, sort of that uh, uh, um, wanting to smoke, and it has the relief of, like, it's more relieving than it is like, oh, fuck yeah. Uh, although, fuck yeah is like the during portion um, conservative religious cultural pressures are literally the cause of this problem. Yes, exactly. A hundred percent. It's less interesting to you because it's deviant from your sexual frame of reference. And this damage is not easy to undo, my friends. I'm begging you with tears in my eyes to quit watching this shit now. Begging you with tears in my eyes? No, you're not. Your most powerful and lasting memories and habits all arise during adolescence. And while you can liberate <sighs> yourself from some of this artificial sexual conditioning that we've unfortunately all probably had to experience, it can still be a deep scar in your brain. And the longer you're subject to this conditioning, the worse it's going to be. Break the conditioning, Western man. Porn is a conspiracy by big cum. God damn it. Your ancestors did great things back when it was harder to see boobs. That's like, it's literally not a coincidence. <laughs> like, what, what? What's great about this? What are you talking about? What's, they, they have wooden skis. They're dragging supplies through a muddy we, war. Do you think war is a great thing better than just everybody coming? Okay, look, if I got to choose between multiple wars and people dying from guns and shit or everybody fucking, I'm going to take the second one tossing that out there i don't think i don't think this is great what's great about this this sucks you think this guy's like fuck yeah i'm i'm trudging through the wilderness probably going to die soon from a gunshot wound in a non-vital area that gets infected and causes my demise or and i'm very glad that that that, that i'm not fucking right now instead boy it would fucking be bad (laughs) like you think you think these guys don't want to fuck Instead of inst- maybe each other, but probably not. Like, like, do you think they want to? You think they'd rather f- go to war or have or have a fuck? You know what I'm saying? I like, just have a fuck. Know that your sexuality can be conditioned, and we know that it is even. Uh. Uh, Raheli, thanks for more me. likely to happen during adolescence. We talked about this earlier, how these associations are formed in your brain with things that aren't even explicitly sexual. If war makes, we, if war makes you not want sex, why brothels? Mm, confirm this sure. empirically by doing studies where men view pornography at the same time they view something like a boot or a jar of pennies. And after a while, they become aroused by simply viewing the boot or the pennies without the pornography even present because they form pennies that association in their brains because they have been conditioned this type of conditioning can affect all sorts of things i'm um, including certain visuals certain objects scents, even things like animal costumes or sexual partners of the same sex that's a red pill that most people aren't ready for what's a red pill what there's a strong argument to be made that taking into account what we've gone over throughout this video you can understand the path of a prematurely and overly sexualized young man watching more extreme types of pornography things that make them anxious things that they know are wrong because those feelings elevate them they help them to chase that that elevated dopamine oh this is when he's done he does the homophobia surprise surprise it's the homophobia and furries but yes um so basically his his argument is the gays are things because they watch the porn and and uh, they get to such a desensitized porn level due to the, the overwhelming proficiency in finding the high-level kink that eventually nothing is going to get you off except for two dudes raw-dogging it on a casting couch. Hell yeah, dude. Hell fucking yeah, bro. That's not how the gays work, by the way. Sorry, the gays. But I'm on to you. All right? I'm on to you. And I understand that uh, you're not all kinky. All right? You don't get to have the kink label. You're not sex gods. You felt less way your whole life. 
You fucking gays. We're watching you gays. We're watching you. We know you're not just kinky sex sex havers. You're just gay. Just Good naturally. Call, ha! Imagine having a natural sexuality like a gay. Can't relate. Mine is socially forced upon me. Mr. Scott Amanga, thanks for the 21 months. No, I'm not going to feed into that anymore. Uh, sorry, guys. I am straight, naturally. It's my bad. <laughs> Last, like, three videos, I've actually accidentally um, fueled the the uh, uh, Jake by question mark? No, sorry, dudes. Sorry. And eventually conditioning himself literally to be a furry or to be sexually attracted to men. Who cares if you're sure, a furry, a lot of it bro? Comes down to prenatal hormone exposure in terms of what is ultimately predictive of its manifestation. But the bottom line is that science has never found a gay gene, and it's certainly never going to find a furry gene. Do with that as you will. Well, furry, I don't think people are consider that a sexuality. What? Does anyone consider furry a sexuality? <laughs> what? It's a fandom, and sometimes it's associated with sex. Who cares, right? Like what? <laughs> <laughs> I was attracted to furries before I was sexually active. See? Wow, wow. Holy shit. We found out through other brain scan studies that not only can these associations be formed with completely random things like squares or pictures of trees, but also that pornography addicts form these associations in their brains faster and more intensely than those who are not addicted to pornography. But the good news is that as it pertains to this type of conditioning, your brain will return to normal after a few months free from whatever you've conditioned it to be aroused to. It will evolve, but backwards. And then once... Uh, by the way, this is wrong. We have found multi multivariant genes that do lead to a propensity to homosexuality. I'm not surprised. I also think personally, uh, and this is probably true, uh, sexuality is, of course, a very internal process. But um, and I'm, I think, I think it's more likely that um, most people, it makes sense, would be attracted to. Um, part partners that have the ability to uh, reproduce procreatively, and then, and then there would be people that just don't feel that way for whatever reason. But uh, so it makes sense from a biological standpoint. Then procreative sex is the thing. That, ooh, straights, whatever. But it also makes a lot of sense how socialized and reinforced that is, and how much that can dictate who you allow yourself to be attracted to. At any given point, which is why I know that I'm sorry, guys, again, very straight because I have no problem with it whatsoever. I'm not I'm not opposed to the idea of making out with a guy except for the reason it doesn't appeal to me. Right. Like from a social perspective, I don't give a shit. I'd be gay as fuck and very proud of it, but I'm just not. So it's just like it's just like one of those things. Um, it's it's. In, yeah, I was going to say it's incredibly complex. It involves all sorts of aspects of our existence. There's an innate uh, sense to it within our biology. There's uh, the sociology of it. Um, there's, I mean, uh, the combination of nature v. nurture. There's the chemicals uh, There's um, that you would like in, get during birth that can change some of your development that might have you a propensity for one way or the other. Um, there are people that um, – uh, are intersex that, um, of course, would have a, a, a you know, the, the genetic pre uh, predisposition, or I guess um, it would be more complicated, I suppose. I assume that an intersex person has a more complicated soup of, uh, uh, like, the alchemy of their, of their um, hormones is probably different due to the fact that they uh, ten, you know, they have they have multiple sets of gonads, right? So, it's 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 just one of those things. It it's very complicated, and however it manifests in you, is correct. It just it is. Um, I don't I don't really know I don't really know how I don't really know how you could be against that. Uh, do you ever wonder if John Doyle would slow down and calm the fuck down if you just watched some porn? <laughs> um, if you were by, who'd be our token cis hat? That's true. Um, non-sexual things awaken your bias. Interesting. What, 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 like what? That's fascinating. Uh, you know who awoke awoke my straightness more than anybody else was Rachel Weiss. I keep going back to it. Keep going back to it. Rachel Weiss uh, in the Mummy. I was like, damn. Also, people like um, um, I'm trying to think. Her ramble was just. You know what was really fascinating? I had a crush on on. You guys remember Alex Mack? I just remember Alex Mack on Nickelodeon. That was like that was the first time I thought like, 
wow, that is an attractive human person. And I don't know why. Yeah. She could turn into goo, yeah. Yeah. I remember that specifically, being like, damn, Alex Mack. Hell yeah. Thrace Fulton, the mummy affirmed my bisexuality. A lot of people cite the mummy when they talk about bisexuality. Let me know I was on the wrong side of the river. <laughs> Dude, if you if you don't find someone attractive in the mummy, I don't understand you. Like, you could be ace as fuck. You, you at least understand there are beautiful people in that fucking movie, dude. Like, the mummy? Whew! Whether it's uh, a Noxuna Moon, if you're into Emotep, whatever. But, I mean, Brendan Fraser, you got the, you got, uh, what's his face? The guy, obviously Rachel Weiss. Then there's all the cowboys that you could, you could select. I mean, man. Man. TV made me straight. I ain't watch much straight TV. I don't know. I'm just, I'm just saying. Uh, Arnold Vosloo. Vosloo. Uh, for research purposes, obviously we can look at the cast. I mean, sure. For research purposes, we should look at the mummy. Uh, the mummy. I think, I th you know what? I agree. I agree. Just a little bit. We should look at the cast of the mummy. Um, yeah, sure. Sure. Uh, let me find, let me, let me, let me find uh, my uh, favorite selection here. I'm gonna have to go with uh, the mummy Rachel Weiss pictures. Um, I mean, I mean, how can you just not look at this human person and be like, "God damn, good for all of us." Thank you, Rachel Weiss. And and frankly, I'm not gonna lie to you. Brendan Fraser is very good looking in these movies. This is peak Brendan Fraser. He's a good looking dude, right? Like like there's there, there ain't nothing wrong if you love a Brendan Fraser. There ain't nothing wrong with it. Okay. I'm fine with it. I accept your take on this. You should love Rachel Weiss more. Look at her. She's beautiful. But um uh, come on. Come on. This nuts. That's nuts. No one should no one should be allowed. No one should be allowed, okay? It doesn't make any sense. Who's the other guy? Who's the other guy? Uh the the the, the mummy uh, uh, what's the guy's name? The tattoo guy. Oded Fair. Holy shit. Look, this guy, if you didn't know it, look, this is how I know I'm not gay. All right. I should want to jump this dude's bones. That makes so much sense in the world, right? Yeah. Come on. You get hit with Brendan Fraser. You get hit with Rachel Weiss, and then, and then... Oded Fair pops on the screen. If you're not into this, I'm sorry. You're just not gay. You're just not gay. That's just how it works. Because I, I understand he's a very attractive fella. That's a very attractive man. And I don't want to pork him, so that's the test. That's really the test. Can you get through the mummy without being attracted to somebody? Probably not. Um, <laughs> give me Tarzan, Brendan Fraser, or give me death. Uh, CGI Dwayne Johnson in Mummy 2 is obviously the hot... What? Uh, Alt-Wrong... Alt-Wrong Alt Anon. Thanks for the two months. What do you get for the two-month anniversary? You get uh, anticipation for the three-month anniversary where your corn badge will start to peel. Um, okay, you make a fair point that movie had pretty things all around it. Really, it did. Um, <laughs> anyway, all right. Continuing on. Once you're in that normal state of mind again, you'll realize how weird those things were and the magnitude of the conditioning that you'd undergone. And what's a very important but perhaps not so obvious consequence of that conditioning? Your PP literally stops working. You as a man have sacrificed the your functionality pee -pee. of your PP at the altar of screen whores. Your ancestors aren't mad, they're just disappointed. But before we screen whores? Your PP has stopped working? Brother, my PP works just fine. Thank you. <laughs> hey, anybody in here have a have a broken PP -pee because of porn? Specifically? I don't think so. I do not think so. Anyone break their pee-pee with porn? <sighs> you have a broken porn pee-pee? Or is your pee-pee just broken? Mine's broken from HRT. It's so totally different. Not porn related. <laughs> this guy's pee-pee stopped working. He's big mad. Maybe, maybe he has got a... The face with broken pee pee. No! I hope for each and every one of you, if you want your pee pee to work, I want it to work. 
If you want your pee-pee to not be a pee-pee, then I want that too. But I want that to work when it does, if you want it to. <laughs> He's into chastity play. We talk about why this happens. Another personal question that I implore you not to answer aloud. You still get morning wood, bro? Remember, you'd wake up, you have to go pee, and you have to like lean over the toilet and touch. What are we not allowed to talk about morning wood for? Your okay. torso was parallel with your pee pee. It was a challenge, but it built character, damn it. But the point is that a lot of guys don't even have that anymore, and they haven't really noticed it or given it too much thought, but that's a problem. What? We talked about that. That was like one of the first things we talked about. This guy is so weird about boners, dude. Hey, guys, if you like, like, <laughs> your pee pee's probably work, okay? As you get older, it happens less often, but let's be real. I get weird boners for no reason all the time still. Just not as often as when I was a teenager. That's it. Morning wood is, is is no different. There is a reason. Yeah, it's an autonomic response. Yeah, I don't know. Is... Morning wood's because you have to pee? I don't think so. Maybe. It does keep you from pissing yourself? Uh, maybe. I'm sure it I'm sure it does. I just I just I just don't I just don't uh I don't have to pee every time. Like I I I definitely woke up with uh uh with boners before, after, and not having to pee in the morning. But yeah. Another problem, we talked about this earlier, symptom of this, uh, being unable to sustain yourself or even get it up, so to speak, when engaging with real women. And I apologize if this is vulgar, but like, come on, man, we're literally- Is this vulgar? Not being able to get it up or maintain yourself when engaging with real women. You want to hear vulgar, dude? Hey, if you got erectile dysfunction when you're in mid fuck, it's probably a medication or 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 chemical issue in your body, not because you like to look at titties on the internet. Okay, you should probably go to a doctor for erectile dysfunction. Don't listen to this fucking guy. Erectile dysfunction can often be an indicator of cardiovascular issues, mental issues, like maybe mental health issues. It could be it could be a side effect of medications you're on. It's not because you fucking jack off, okay, dude? It just isn't. Uh, you might, yeah. If you're engaging with a real a real woman and you're not into it, you might be gay or ace, or that person doesn't isn't attractive to you, like. That could be fine. Or maybe you're just not in the headspace for it. That's okay, too. Maybe think about other stuff. Like, like there's lots of things that this could be. I don't think it's because you jacked off a little bit. Jack off to your heart's content, dude. Just understand that there is a difference between jacking off uh, uh, and watching porn and your expectations uh, in real life, uh, how consent works, uh, all the things that apply. Um, I'll... I'll Often, obviously, porn is like is like fantasy ideation. If you can make that fantasy reality, uh, if you're if you're among the luckies, uh, uh, then do so absolutely um, with consent at all times. So that's that's really uh, if you if you gotta if your if your peepee's broke, something else is probably going on. Um, I had this problem when I ate too much candy, so my blood didn't my blood flow didn't work. This is a reason I smoke instead. Oh. I've never gotten whiskey dick from edibles. I have been more numbed to experiences with alcohol before, but I've still done it. I don't know. I'm just a, I'm a, I'm just a fucking coomer, though, dude. I'm not a very good example of this. Really talking about pornography here, so to expect TVY7 caliber dialogue would just be unrealistic. But this, too, is part of erectile dysfunction caused by pornography. And before we get into the data, simply understand that it is not normal for young men to be in these positions and not be good to go. But anyways, there's a couple dozen studies linking sexual dysfunction to pornography use because of everything that we talked about earlier. Chicks just built different. No, I'm just a horny slut. And this is the part where the pornography ad greened out. What is that? What's greening out? Green out. Green... Out. What? Greening out is the experience of nausea, unease, and other distressing symptoms that sometimes occur after consuming too much cannabis. Oh, oh, that's that's a THC overdose, for the record. No, I've never done that. That's a THC overdose. I have greened out. But not because I was fucking. <laughs> nope. Yeah, that literally, if you've experienced that, that is actually an overdose on weed. Addicts chime in like, um, causation does not equal correlation. And it's like, wow, dude, I also have taken statistics 101. Sick, bro. I almost, I almost wish I'd gone to college so that I could write incredibly pretentious academic papers on concepts that I noticed that are just basically <laughs> posts. Like this one in particular, I see it everywhere. And once you see it, dude, you're talking about fucking and you name, you put porn in the title. Why are you bleeping shit, dude? 
My goodness. You can never unsee it. I like to refer to it as the horseshoe theory of practical intelligence. And it's basically that in terms of practical <sighs> intelligence, there is greater unity between those with above average intelligence and below average intelligence than there is between people um, with average intelligence in either of the aforementioned groups. What? So the both, both ends of the bell curve kind of come together like a horseshoe. And what I think this really comes down to... And he, of course, thinks he's of the high-level intelligence fella. Of course. Yeah. This is another way, if you believe the, the horseshoe theory of intelligence he just brought up for no reason. Uh, this is why you would think that someone like Donald Trump is like real smart 40 chess. Two is that people with average intelligence, people who are mediocre, uh, they're still smart enough to realize that they're smarter than some people. And so they cope with their feelings of mediocrity by asserting themselves over those people in ways that are just often incorrect. I'll give you an example. You're doing it right now. Literally right now he's doing it. What? <laughs> Defund the police. Go ask any stupid person. And I don't mean someone who you disagree with politically. I mean like a legitimately unintelligent person. Ask them what they think about defunding the police. And they will tell you. Now wait just a minute. That's about the dumbest idea I've ever heard. Who's going to catch the criminals, etc. I can only make fun of white people or else I'll get banned. <sighs> and, you know, if you ask someone with average intelligence, someone who's unexceptional, someone who's probably college educated, go ask them. That's when you're going to get the answer. Oh, the baby bird. Uh, Freem, thanks, man. Appreciate the prime, dude. IQ of 104. Hey, what do you think about the police? Those are the people who will tell you, well, crime is caused by circumstance. We need social workers to handle these cases, etc. Whereas if you told an unintelligent person that social workers could prevent these things, they would just laugh at you. Because while they may be unintelligent, they've actually retained more common sense than those with average intelligence because they actually need it to survive and get by in the world. Whereas people with average intelligence don't necessarily need that common sense because they have greater <laughs> access to opportunity. Yeah, you know, you know what common sense tells me? Here's, here's the common sense example of this, okay? Common sense example. <clears throat> okay. You have two people in a relationship, right? One of them is abusing the other, okay? One of them is abusing the other, and there's a lot of mental health issues that are going on. One of them is off their medication. The other person is, um, is a victim of cyclical abuse and is basically, you know, um, held hostage from a, from a, from a, from a mental perspective uh, akin to like a, like a you know, um, uh, what's the word I'm looking for? Uh the uh, Stockholm syndrome. Sorry. Um, to where, where's the point? You know, you make excuses for your abuser and stuff. This is very common shit. Um, common sense says, according to John Doyle, common sense says we should, uh, in response to a nine one one call to that situation, we should send an unprepared high school graduate with a gun into the situation rather than a social worker. That's what his common sense says. Interesting. Okay. So, uh, Prada Mittens, thanks for the tier one. I pre or pro probably pro Prada Mittens, right? Not Prada Mittens. I'm an idiot. Um, Prada Mittens, I'm assuming. Uh, thanks for the tier one so much. Uh, hopefully, hopefully you stick around and enjoy it. Uh, yeah. Uh, <laughs> look, that's, that's just so stupid. That's, ooh, it's common sense. Send a normal cop in. What? What? It's like, it's like sending a guy who, like, works on lawnmowers to fix your car it's like he might sort of have interacted with car maintenance in the past but he's a lawnmower fella he does lawnmowers not cars they're different <laughs> and of course if you ask someone with above average intelligence about defunding the police they'll just laugh at you as well it's like the sleep woke bespoke meme and it's the same with this you got the low IQ people who will say well gosh dang it I don't want my son watching that internet pornograph Juniper Hart, I just going right his mind. <laughs> you got the average IQ people like, actually, studies that have corroborated that have only found associations, and causation does not equal correlation. I am so smart. And then the high IQ people are like, hey, we're not talking about random variables. Like, for example, the fact that there's almost a perfect correlation between U.S. crude oil imports and the domestic per capita consumption of chicken. We're not talking about that. We're actually talking about what we know about neurobiology and neuropsychology, and we're applying that appropriately and saying, hey, given what we know about this, we predict that with this new epidemic of pornography consumption, this is what's probably going to happen. These are the effects that will manifest. And then, oh, wait a minute. Exactly what would logically be expected to happen has happened, and it's reflected in our research. But then the 104 IQ people are like, no, but I must be smart. Causation does not equal correlation. Those are my least favorite types of people. Everyone uh, okay. Dual Axe, thanks for the 16 months. After listening to this, I'm convinced John's doing all this as projection. Uh, you might. I think some of you Genesis, I want to get rid of the lower people. I just want to get rid of the people in the middle. They're annoying. Low IQ nationalism, I'm here for it. But that aside. Low IQ nationalism, I'm here for it. Of course he is. It's also basically impossible to do experiments on this, uh, the effects of this type of stuff because you can't find a control group of men who haven't been exposed to it anymore. 
Uh, Thrace Fulton, thanks for the 50 biddies. We'll get more into that in a second, but essentially what happens is that because of your sexual conditioning, you have certain expectations wired into your brain. And dopamine will elevate when something is better than you expected, but it'll also drop when something isn't as good as you expected. And once you've- Can't believe he's not, he doesn't like people who are telling him he's wrong. I know, I know right? Surprise. Condition yourself to internet pornography. Real sex is never going to be able to meet that expectation because it can't compete with all of the variables that classify it as a super normal stimuli. I don't know, dude. I've had some pretty good real life sex. I don't know, man. Look, uh, is it? <laughs> hey, maybe you're just not. Maybe you're just not doing it right, right? Or maybe you're not communicating what you would like out of it enough. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. Uh, like I've had bad sex a couple times, but not really. Like mostly when I was really young, when I didn't know how to communicate, when my partner didn't know what they were doing, when I didn't know what I was doing, like all sorts of stuff like that. But like in my adult life. It's pretty rare to have, like, a bad experience if you're honest with the person that you're with. Like, what? Like, come on. And I'm, I'm just, I'm, <laughs> I'm just saying, if, if I have had sex better than I have, and the experience is way better than I've had watching porn, for sure. Tippy-top porn, not even close to mid-tier fuck. For me... Uh, it's not because I'm out here, like, like, <laughs> doing all sorts of fucking crazy shit. It's just because of the way that it, it, it happens. Communicating, yes. And even sometimes I'm not good at communicating all the time, but sometimes I am. I don't know. It just depends on what's going on in your life and, uh, and who you're with and if you're comfortable and stuff like that. You know, it just takes all, all kinds of shit. Like, I, I don't know. I don't know. If this dude, he's obviously not having very good sex, which I'm not surprised with because nobody wants to fuck conservatives. That's true. That's true. And resultantly, your unconscious expectations probably won't be met, and your dopamine will drop, which means your PP will drop because you need consistent dopamine to maintain your, sexual your arousal pee -pee and function PP. When it comes to PP functionality, I trust the science. And the science says that you need adequate dopamine in your reward circuitry and in the sexual centers of your brain. And obviously, there are different types of erectile dysfunction. Sometimes it's caused by things like blood vessels or nerve problems. But we're talking about psychological causes. And if you look at scans of gray matter in the brain's reward center, mm. in the brain's sexual centers, in the hypothalamus, you'll find that lost gray matter equates with loss of nerve cell branches and connections with other nerve cells, which means that it's not just performance anxiety, but it can also be a literal consequence of changes to the reward circuitry of your brain, which have resulted in persistently reduced dopamine signaling. Bad sex. He's just talking about bad sex. Which explains why your morning wood is gone and why it's going to take months to come back once you start to break this conditioning. And this matches the results of another brain scan study conducted in Germany um, and published in JAMA Psychiatry. The results are less gray matter and general desensitization, which is what we talked about earlier. And you can measure things like gray matter and desensitization in a brain scan. But the nucleus of your sexual conditioning, so to speak, the real magnitude of it can't be articulated on paper by some lab coat. That's some okay. Uh, here's a meme that was just shared. Let's see about it. Uh, with the obvious big boy super chat. Uh, sexual partners on average uh, than West. Uh, another study indicated that East German women typically enjoyed sex much more with 70% orgasm rate, at least partially because communism allowed East German women to feel equal, far more independent, and far less oppressed. <gasps> Weird. Lefties just fuck better. That's true something that will ultimately be dependent on your level of honesty and self-understanding. But to get back into the addiction components of it. That guy, oh, look at him. He's so sad about not coming well. His, his, his temple is, is engorged with, with blood vessel breakage because he hasn't done a coom. Is anybody who hears this can just dismiss it by saying, well, as long as it's not addictive, who cares? You can just stop anytime you want. We've already talked about those types of people and classified them properly as people who are basically coping by rationalizing their sexual degeneracy. We've also talked about the characteristics of this addiction, specifically that just like substance addiction, it elevates your dopamine significantly, which is why the same nerve cells are active as when cocaine and methamphetamine are used, and that this is different from all other natural rewards. And even though addictions are not all the same, we still know that they all essentially cause the same core changes to your brain, which can be summarized basically as a craving and preoccupation with doing whatever it is that you're addicted to, a loss of control with how much you're doing it and the ways in which you're doing it, and also the negative um, consequences of you doing it, whether those are financial, physical, mental, social, doesn't matter. So what's interesting about this is that we know that the substances that follow this pattern can and do create addictions, but they're much more... Vegan women taste better? I have not experienced that. Like, uh, as far as a difference in, in, in taste. I think that's a myth. It's a big myth. <laughs> Frequent than you would think. Is that five? Is that a fifth? Is that a fifth degen? Hell yeah, dude. Um, I 
do, 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 do. Only causes about 10 to 15. Big vegan lobby has arrived. Their vaginas taste better. They don't. In my experience, it's not very dissimilar. Everyone has a different taste, but not everybody is particularly better or worse. Percent of human and animal test subjects to become addicted um, when trials are conducted. But we have to be very careful with the conclusions that we're drawing from this. Because it's not that we're safe from addiction, but rather that we're relatively safe from those specific addictions. But in terms of natural rewards, things like those supernormal stimuli that we discussed earlier, things like junk food, you're not safe at all. Why is this? Why is it that even if you're not susceptible to addiction, why is it that you can still get extremely addicted to supernormal stimuli in the forms of junk food and pornography? I don't know. Maybe because your brain is designed to pursue food and sex. Maybe that's why. Food and sex are S tier, drugs and alcohol are lower. How many people are addicted to drugs and alcohol? I don't know. But I do know that 70% of American adults are overweight and fully 37% of them are obese. That's going to cause a lot more deaths than drugs are. Libertarians are like, yeah, I want a small government to legalize all drugs. Nice try. I actually want a big government to usher in state-enforced physical fitness. That's a joke. Kind of. He's such a fucking authoritarian, dude. The point is that we know what that supernormal stimulus is doing to American society. Now, what if you had one that was available in even greater quantity, novelty, and it was totally free? Not good, folks. Not good. And it's difficult to find data on this because it tends to be something done in private. But we've got data from 2014 that found that 33% of men between the ages of 18 and 30 either thought they were addicted. Isn't he a conservative? Well, yeah, but he's a fascist, too. Or were unsure, which is significantly more than the just 5% of men between the ages of 15 and 68 who felt the same. And we've got two studies from 2016, both found that it was about 28%. Now, even ignoring what we know about the upward trends in terms of how many people are addicted, the age at which they're getting addicted, and even ignoring how catastrophic it would be for society if even just 28 or 33 percent of the men were addicted to pornography, which we'll elaborate upon later. I'm going to just go ahead and assert that about 85 percent of men in this country are addicted to porn. 80 he's going to say 80. He's just I'm just going to go ahead and assert 85 percent of men are addicted to pornography. I'm just going to go ahead and do it because that's 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 what you do. It's what you do. You just go ahead and you assert it. That seems reasonable. Good job, John. Way to fucking be, my guy. 85%, that's the figure. What's my source? My feelings? <laughs> yeah, I know. I know it is. Uh, <laughs> it's just his feelings, bro. <laughs> Christ's sake. I just, I feel that this is true. And if you've consumed pornography in the last 365 days, you're not allowed to dispute this because your consciousness is corrupted by desire and addiction. In the last 365 days, if you've seen an online titty, you're invalid. Does that mean that John Doyle has not seen a titty online in the last year? Is that true? Do you think that John Doyle hasn't jacked off in, in a year? I believe that he hasn't jacked off in a year, personally. I believe that no one else has jacked him off either. <laughs> Shut up, Avotion. You probably have, though. You probably actually have, to be totally honest. Like even even the gays are exposed. You know, it's just it's just you know it's 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 so it's so tragic. You know, it's just so tragic. You see. You simply can't see the same things that I can see. Your third eye is, is calcified by the smut and tarnish of lust. It is at least 85%. And anyone who tells you otherwise is trying to hurt you. <laughs> it's at least 85%. And if they don't believe my feelings-based words, they are trying to hurt you. <laughs> what? <laughs> Amazing, dude. Good shit. All jokes aside, uh, one of the first figures that we went over was 80% of men watching pornography at least once a week. Given what we've been talking about, I find it very hard to believe that they're not addicted. And then I myself threw in an extra 5% for good measure. There we have it, 85% at least. And remember, anyone who tells you otherwise is trying to hurt you. Now, that being said, a lot of people, even in the medical and scientific fields, think that, uh, well, we can't use what we know about addiction to understand compulsive behaviors like gambling and pornography use, and there's just no such thing as a behavioral addiction. That's what they say. Only substance addictions, like with heroin and the other drugs that we mentioned earlier. And this is often promoted by the media, um, but the most updated research that we have actually contradicts this idea. For example, if you look in the DSM-5, addiction is one of the only mental disorders that can be reproduced at will in a laboratory setting. In other words, we know exactly... <laughs> <laughs> is that true? No. How to make animals and people addicted to something and we can do it whenever we want to. Wouldn't it be a shame if oligarchs use this knowledge to harm and profit off our society? Okay, relax, relax. The point is that we can study what happens to the brain in these settings, even down to the molecular level. And what we find with thousands of brain studies, whether it's addiction to methamphetamine, heroin, whatever, is that all addictions <sighs> modify the same fundamental brain mechanisms and produce a recognized set of anatomical and chemical alterations. There is no doubt amongst addiction experts that behavioral and chemical addictions are fundamentally the same. 
We've got like 230 brain studies on internet addicts that reveal the same changes that we've been talking about in substance addicts. So if we know that the internet is addictive, it's evident that contemporary pornography is as well. And sure enough, this is confirmed by the brain studies on people who watch pornography. There was a landmark review done recently which outlined the four fundamental brain changes caused by addiction. They might ring a bell. So again, this is... This is not an argument to suggest that porn should be banned. It's an argument to suggest that porn should be used more properly. And did you know that you could you could you could achieve this by um and I know this is going to be a shock chat. You could achieve a more reasonable usage of porn by the populace over the course of time by Comprehensive sexual education. Whoa. Can these smooth nuggets please stop using my field of study to make their point while using my study as a punching bag? <laughs> True. Yeah, comprehensive sexual uh, uh, education. Comprehensive. And they are sensitization, desensitization, dysfunctional prefrontal circuitry, and a malfunctioning stress system. And studies on contemporary pornography users find evidence of each of these. Start with the first one, sensitization. That can be defined as an unconscious super memory of pleasure, which when activated triggers powerful cravings. Your parents leave, all of a sudden you feel compelled to watch pornography. Uh, <laughs> I only masturbate socially, like crack. Dressed out, same thing happens. True. You see a model on Instagram, that's what that is. There's about 20 studies reporting sensitization and cue reactivity in pornography users. And even when you try to quit or you don't use it for a while, those sensitized pathways are still there and they grow even stronger for a while. Your reward system is literally begging you to stimulate it. And with that sensitization amplified, your brain's reward center uses the same mechanisms involved in normal learning and memory. And it might get... <laughs> this guy's name is Stephen Hyman. <laughs> you know, like... the Weaker once you quit after a while, but... They're going to remain there for a very long time, depending on how intense your addiction was. That's why so many anti-addiction organizations advocate complete abstinence from whatever you're addicted to, because anything else will sustain those developed pathways, which won't allow you to get better. Oh, of course. Just abstinence, guys. Just abstinence. Abstinence is the only way. Of course, that would be a scenario in a chemical dependency, uh, but not uh, a non-chemical dependent uh, addiction, in which case you can um, literally just, just chill the fuck out, and then, then there you go. Um, yeah, I was just about to say, um, uh, ju just denying um, the reality of the thing that you like, um, in this case, I guess it's porn and or orgasms. Um, having an orgasm isn't harmful. Sorry. Sorry, John. Uh, having, having an orgasm isn't harmful. You can just do that, um, at any point. The, the problem that gets the, or the part that gets harmful is when you associate, um, you know, how, I guess, I guess how you associate orgasms and if it becomes antisocial or if it becomes destructive, uh, if it becomes a situation where, um, you know, there, there are aspects of actual addiction that have happened, but it's not 85% of men. That's for fucking sure. Um, Unless, unless you consider addiction, I I come regularly, <laughs> but a, a, a porn addiction would have to affect other aspects of your life. You'd have to deny responsibilities. You'd have to, um, you know, you'd, you'd have to you'd have to seek it out in ways that became destructive. Then we get into the second one, which is desensitization, which is basically a numbed response to that pleasure. This is typically the first addiction-related brain change that addicts notice. Basically, the reduced dopamine and opioid signaling uh, leaves suppose. you less sensitive to everyday pleasures and starving for things that will raise those levels again. And this is the cycle of tolerance with which we're all familiar. You need more of something to achieve the previous effect, and it keeps getting worse and worse. And we talked earlier about how your brain will release Kreb to inhibit dopamine in your reward circuitry, which will then decrease as you abstain from your vice. But this itself doesn't really explain why people still feel numb and depressed even months after quitting their vice. And that's because the more lasting causes would be things like lost gray matter declining dopamine and opioid receptors, which literally means that instead of your brain just protecting itself. He just keeps saying these things over and over. Is he is he gonna is he gonna like do do a thing and 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 like actually change change subjects here or what? By the way, does it just keep going? Are we on level number three forever? We're on four until so we're at fifty six forty two right now. Part four? Oh my god. All right, I guess we got 10 more minutes. It's not that bad. 56. There we go. 
literally means that instead of your brain just protecting itself from excessive um, stimulation with Kreb, it's also going to remove some of your receptors so that you're less sensitive to the stimulation. It literally removes your D2 receptors so that you're less sensitive to the stimulation. And D2 receptors just so happen to help control cravings. So without them, your cravings are going to be that sure, much man. harder to control. On the bright side, your brain can rebuild these receptors over time, but you know, you're gonna have to quit frying your reward circuitry Thanks first. Thanks for finally winning spread, right? is the biggest driver of addiction. You're dealing with incredibly powerful cravings that keep increasing in intensity and then experiencing less pleasure in everyday life because of desensitization, which makes you gravitate towards the things that give you the most dopamine because you just wanna feel something, basically. Remember, fellas, you're not horny, you're just depressed. And there have been at least six studies confirming these neurological effects in pornography users. After that, we get into the dysfunctional okay. prefrontal circuitry, which manifests as your willpower being weakened, and you become hyper-reactive to the cues that trigger your behavior. And this is because your prefrontal cortex is the part of your brain that basically governs your actions. It's where you plan things, evaluate consequences, costs, benefits, etc. And most importantly, it governs your willpower and tells you not to do things that you might regret later. And there are two types of pathways extended into our reward system from it. One of them says do it, the other says don't do it. So if the emotional centers in your reward system want you to hit somebody, the prefrontal cortex will be like, hey dear guy, let's think about this first. But with addiction, the path. Oh, I like that his inside it voice sounds like a youper. That's what I like. Pathways that encourage behavior become increasingly powerful, while the pathways that discourage and inhibit behavior become increasingly weak. Okay. It's literally like you've got you know the angel and the devil on your shoulder, but the angel's just a regular dude, and the devil's pumping steroids into himself. He's like Bane. And we found physical evidence of this in fMRI studies, and also evidence through specialized psychological tests. <laughs> Again, it's just suppressing your sexuality. I don't know. I'm going to go insane. Honestly, has brought up a new point, and he hasn't brought up a. Has he brought up a new point in the past 45 minutes? Even if it's bad faith, he's just been walking in circles. He really has been walking in circles, which is why we're only going to finish uh, this part, and then um, we're going to do um, part four and I assume five next time. Um, uh, the the Dieter Dude Bides. Thanks, dude. And V. Kylo Cypher. Thanks for following. Uh, if only John's prefrontal cortex filter had caught this entire video trip. And this can be reflected in at least 13 studies of pornography users. And then the last one, the malfunctioning stress <coughs> system, which means that your cravings are stronger, Excuse your willpower is weaker, you've got a lot of withdrawal symptoms. This is because your stress system is a little bit more nuanced than just fight or flight. It also modifies your brain to protect itself from long-term stressors. And experts view addiction as a stress disorder because it not only affects your stress hormones, uh, like adrenaline and cortisol, but it also induces several changes in your brain's stress system. And there are three changes in particular that make it extremely difficult to quit. The first is that stress increases dopamine and cortisol, which means that even something only slightly stressful can trigger your cravings, even if there's nothing to trigger it directly. The sensitized addiction pathways are already there, and those in themselves are enough. The second one is that stress inhibits the prefrontal cortex, which means that your impulse control and ability to fully comprehend the consequences of your actions are both inhibited. And lastly, when you're addicted to something and you don't give it to your brain, your brain basically freaks out. And you're he said this before. Your stress system goes into overdrive. This is what causes withdrawal symptoms like anxiety. Like, wh like, why not? Why not cut this to like a forty-five minute thing if you're just going to repeat yourself? Depression, being tired, insomnia, irritability, mood swings, etc. If this sounds like you, take note of that. Remember, you're not depressed. You're just addicted to pornography. We've got three studies that demonstrate these dysfunctional stress systems in pornography users, and even one of them showed that it was epigenetically altering your stress genes. So, to summarize these four, longer video equals more correct. True. Neuroplastic brain changes. You're like, hey, this is epic. Your brain's like, yeah, do more. Your brain's like, no, this isn't epic. In fact, very little of anything is epic anymore. And then your brain's like, do more of the originally epic thing. And your brain's also like, I literally just can't even stop you at this point. And then collectively, no one's having a good time. Basically, you get the point. And coom brains used to be like, there's no... This is what happens when someone hasn't taken English 101 and has to learn how to edit. I, it, yeah, it... I don't know. I feel, I feel like even if we go on tangents, we're a little bit more succinct about our points here on a live stream when we do this. I don't know. It doesn't, doesn't really seem reasonable. Such thing as porn addiction, no symptoms, we need studies. And so in 2017, we had two studies that confirmed these symptoms in pornography users, another one just with internet addicts who were also pornography addicts, and then three more um, with escalation in tolerance as it pertains to pornography. And then another 14 more with that escalation into weirder genres, which is part of the tolerance aspect of pornography addiction. So basically, we say yet again, anyone who tells you that this isn't real or that it isn't a problem is a coping addict who should not, <laughs> not be listened to. Who says that porn addiction isn't a thing? I just don't, I don't understand. I didn't know that was, I didn't know there were people out there who's like, there's zero porn addiction. Porn addiction, not real, never been a thing. N I've n literally never heard of that. And this epigenetics has nothing to do with changes after birth. What the fuck? I don't know includes the DSM. For those unfamiliar, the DSM is basically a book full of flashcard terms that women who think they've had a hard time in life will pay $100,000 to memorize a fifth of. The the DSM is not that. The the Okay. So the, the DSM is... <laughs> <laughs> Jesus fucking Christ. If you okay, look, DSM 5. Let's just let's just bring it up. Uh it's about the uh, the the Diagnostic and Statistical Manual of Mental Disorders. Um you can, yeah, let me see. 
Uh, do they have just the fact sheet? American Psychiatric. Okay, sure. Um, so the DSM-5, um, uh, this is just the fifth edition of the, uh, of the DSM, and it is basically the current nomenclature and typical diagnoses um, that, that go into different aspects of, of any sort of um, mental disorder. Um, was it 2020? Yeah, the last update is 2013, so I'm sure we'll get a new one at some point. Um, was it was the DSM-4 in 1980? Um, anyway, as, as things as things change, um, it becomes more nuanced and better. It's just an American Psychiatric Association's sort of codex of um, classifications for different uh, different um, issues that they that might arise. Uh, they change wording to make sure it's more descriptive and and less, um, um, you know, more up to the time so they're not denigrating everybody. For instance, um, uh, Section 2, Diagnostic Criteria, uh, encodes neuro, neurodevelopmental disorders. So they stop using the R slur, uh, which has, be, you know, it became socially a slur. It, they changed uh, mental R word, uh, has a new name. It's called intellectual disability. And that's just to be a more inclusive language, and also because it's not necessarily about the the inability to um, understand things. It's just the way that they understand things isn't the same way that we make the pathways if we're not if we don't have an intellectual disability. Um, there's a autism spectrum disorder now incorporates Asperger disorder, childhood dis. dis uh, disintegrative disorder, per- pervasive developmental disorder, uh, not that we're specified, um, and um, there's just a bunch of stuff. It just gets more nuanced. Uh, they make subcategories for things. Schizophrenia has new things, bipolar-related disorders, depressive disorders, anxiety disorders, obsessive compulsive trauma and stressor-related disorders like PTSD, disassociative disorders. <coughs> I mean, <coughs> excuse me. A fluffy went into my throat. Uh, it just goes on and on. The DSM is uh, not flashcards for people that want to learn stuff to be woke or whatever he just said. Uh, the DSM is literally a catalog of the profession of of psychology and psychiatry moving forward, um, like mental health experts in general, uh, moving forward to um, have sort of a collectivized and uh, understanding of certain disorders so that we can more accurately diagnose people and help them. That's it. That's the whole thing. It's a step-by-step guide. Yes. Um, thank you, uh, uh, Vagrant Tronind and Heartmonk for following. Um, think they'll add conservatism at some point? Yikes. Probably not. So that they can supplement what you were describing with the professional language, which really just lets you know how smart they are. The DSM has long been criticized for being politicized. It's not pol- Oh my fucking god. This guy is not smarter than the people that put together the DSM. Again, this is a, this is a, a very big Dunning-Kruger thing that happens with people on the right that think especially people that think they're intellectual and conservative at the same time. The problem the problem with this is you do not have Look at this fucking guy. He didn't go to college for this shit. He didn't go to college for fucking anything. He does not have an education in this. He just thinks he says words good. That's literally his his expertise is limited to I word good. It ha, he he does not have the time to gain a PhD in any of these topics. He is he is capable, hopefully. Uh, although in my discussions with him, he is not capable of this. But I I would assume he would be at least minimally capable of understanding some of the data that gets put out. Usually, it has to be communicated through, uh, you know. The sort of thesis at the end of the uh, at the end of the study, so that you can try to understand it better. Sort of the breakdown. Um, he's not a psychologist. He's not. He's not a mental health professional. He is not qualified to to denigrate or or delegitimize the DSM. He has a YouTube channel, and it's called. And he he says heck off, Kami. Like he he calls himself epic. Like he is not the type of guy. With his with his American flag lapel pin to have any sort of legitimacy in regards to this conversation whatsoever. Nor do I, which is why I agree with experts. <laughs> Jesus Christ, I do not have the time in my life, the bandwidth 
in my in my in my ability to learn it or the desire to learn uh, all that needs to go into uh, how you would describe mental disorders. I have a layman's understanding due to the, uh, of of some of these things, right? Some of you have lived experiences of some of, some of these things. It's 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 wild. <clears throat> So you're okay to say what others can or can't say. If that's what you heard from this guy who just got deleted from my chat, if 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 what you heard if what you heard is you get to tell people what they can or cannot say from he is not an expert at at the DSM-5, nor is he a professional psychologist, nor does he have an education that would allow him to comment on this with any sort of legitimacy whatsoever, and you heard a free speech issue, I think you're too dumb to hang out in my chat. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to go there. I'm going to say that you are actually too dumb to be here in this chat. There we go. He was rationalizing the harsler. With their practices. Stupid. And this is, of course, because it's you know hard to look at things objectively when you're addicted to touching your own pee-pee, right? This is why they've rejected the idea of hypersexuality, despite the fact that many others have described the reasons for doing so as illogical. But the American Society of Addiction Medicine has stated that there is no doubt that sexual behavior addictions are real and that addiction is a primary disorder which indicates underlying brain changes. And the DSM has even been criticized by Thomas Insel, Insel, who is the director of the National Institute of Mental Health, precisely because they too often rely on political decisions, which simply defy reality. Might ring a bell with some other issues, but he even said that the DSM should no longer be considered the gold standard and that he... The National Institute of Mental Health. What happens if I look that up? For serious, John Doyle needs to stop quoting DSM unless he knows how to read it. <laughs> National Institute of Mental Health. Let's just see. Lead federal uh, agency. Okay. One of 27 institutes and centers that make up the National Institutes of Health. Okay. <clears throat> and so if I... Uh, Oh, it has a budget of one point six three billion. Uh, I wait. Didn't he say someone named Incel was involved? What? Could call, baby. Boo. Organizational Could history. Call. A series of name changes. So we can just look at the history of this. As your makeout, thanks for giving one to Ken Toes. I appreciate you, even though you're horny posting. That's okay. You're allowed. Uh, uh, okay. So it started off as the Narcotics Division. And then the Division of Mental Hygiene, Mental Hygiene Division, uh, Institute of Mental Health, Individu uh, 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 Alcohol, Drug Abuse, and Mental Health Administration. So it started off as an anti-drug use thing used for, I assume, uh, it started in 1929-30, so there was an opiate issue again uh, in during that time, of course. Um you have uh, post World War One, uh, where people were using morphine and stuff um, for pain, obviously in the um, in the uh, war, uh, which led to a lot of abuse and addiction. You also had um, um, sort of an influx of of Asian immigration, which brought opium to the states, um, which also popularized, especially on the west West Coast. And you also had a lot of medications that had opium within them that were legalized. Um, and obviously we know about opium and opiates in general, they are incredibly addictive. Um, but that, that, that's where it started off as a fucking like proto drug war, uh, national institute of mental health. Interesting. Okay. Also cocaine. Well, yeah, that's an opiate. He was reorienting research from the NIM or not an opium. H away from the DSM right? for exactly that reason. And also important to note is that the DSM Please. hasn't been updated in 10 years. Do you know what's happened in the last 10 years? It's actually been up updated in eight years. What's exploded in the last 10 years? Pornography usage, as we've discussed, in terms of use, severity of use, distribution, etc. Like, Okay, so if the DSM, when it is updated, whenever that might be, whenever the update comes for, for the DSM, okay? Um, what if they agree that there is a, there's, there's a situation regarding uh, uh, porn addiction? Huh. Weird. Like, what if they just do that? <laughs> Along with all the research pr Oh, we're almost done, Azure. If you want to stick around for like like 15 minutes, but live your life, you know. Proving that this is a huge problem. The DSM doesn't even care about that cuz the yeah, DSM we're almost done. a bunch of I'm not going to do the whole thing. We're 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 leaving after that. Generous, but that being said, they did come out with something in 2017. 
in which they tried to say that these types Eight of problems minutes were of compulsive disorders video. instead of addictions. But the top neuroscientists in the world actually think that they should be recategorized as an addictive disorder because of the neurobiological similarities between it and other behavioral disorders. Sure. And this brings us to the difference between a compulsion and an addiction. Okay. People will basically cope by saying that anything you do, whether it's gambling or watching pornography or playing video games, all of those aren't addictions, but rather they're compulsions. Oh, they can be both, bro. And they do this because it makes them feel less. Did he say degenerates again? Okay, I'm going to give you another one. God damn, dude. That's six. That is six. guilty about being addicted to things basically because they'll say that addictions can only be chemical addictions the truth is that no no one says that addictions can only be chemical addictions nobody says that what are you talking about if they do say that they're being pedantic and saying that well yeah it's a chemical chemical addiction because your brain creates chemicals nobody who has a serious conversation about addiction says that chemical dependency is the only form of addiction what are you talking about you can be a, you can show addiction patterns for abusive partners what do you what you can show addiction patterns towards lots of behaviors you're just so dumb this isn't real no one talks about this like you talk about this that used to be a thing when people talk about how alcoholism is a disease i guess jesus christ he's so dumb dude if you examine the neural correlates for a compulsion and an addiction they're practically identical your brain doesn't know the difference so any rhetoric suggesting that there was a difference is purely for obfuscation it's a red herring it's all the same to your brain same sensitization same changes everything that we've discussed <sighs> and while we've been discussing all chrissy over the 50 bitties incel was criticizing the fact that the DSM, by the way, incel is the last name of an individual. Um, incel was criticizing the fact that DSM focuses on recognizing symptoms rather than causes. He was not saying the DSM was too political. Oh, surprise. Yeah, and the DSM will evolve over time. And that, that's the good part about it. It is a, it is a malleable, uh, uh, it is a malleable document that uh, uh, over time uh, changes with the current verbiage. And just because the DSM doesn't have something in it doesn't mean professionals aren't working on something. When they decide that they have an update worthy of it, they will compile all the new data and put that in. The new data exists right now. There might be psychologists and people that work on the DSM that agree with John to some extent as far as like categorizing, and he just showed a study, categorizing the fact that, that – uh, uh, porn addiction can be a thing. It's like, yeah, no one really disagrees with that. It's not part of the DSM. But, I mean, like, it could be in future iterations of it. Who gives a shit? The DSM is not the end-all, be-all of the whole thing. The DSM is 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 just a thing that we use to, to try to categorize stuff. But everything in the DSM is true. Things outside of the DSM are not inherently untrue. That makes sense. It's it's just a it's a tool that people use to con to to sort of gather information. That's it. I don't know why we have to defend it so badly. Seems weird, right? All these problems, addiction in general, uh, a lot of people have probably been thinking, well, okay, it's bad for me. It can be addicting, but I still like it. So how much is okay? The problem with this is that it assumes the problem is binary. Yeah, of course. Causes aren't uniform for psychology. Like Absolutely. our friends on the left would say, it's actually non-binary, which means that it isn't as simple. It's just saying you're either addicted to porn or you're a casual. More importantly, the question of like, well, I guess in this case, it'd be bimodal. Where do I draw the line? Ignore something very important that we've been talking about, which is the reality of neuroplasticity. The fact that your brain is always changing and adapting and learning in response to its environment. And with what we're talking about here, which are supernormal stimuli, it happens almost instantly. And this has been confirmed with studies on topics ranging from video games to junk food that have all found that it only takes a short pattern of use to change the composition and function of your brain. Sure. We've also got studies that unsurprisingly show relationships between porn consumption and addiction-related brain changes, and also that about a fifth of high school <laughs> students who watch pornography uh, more than once a week experience low sexual desire compared to 0% of those who were not watching it. So the takeaway is that you don't even have to be fully addicted for your brain to start changing and for you to start experiencing some of the negative effects of that. Well, low sexual desire because they meet their desires regularly. What are you talking about? Also, if they don't have sexual desire, who cares? They don't have to have a bunch of sexual desire. I do not care. But we understand that a, a person that, that engages in uh, high levels of porn use does have sexual desire. It's just, like, not a big deal. <laughs> like... I don't know because they they've already been they've already been taken care of. Uh, but Jake, they need to be making white babies. Oh yeah. As you're getting older and you're learning, you're changing your sexual environment. All of that is going to affect your brain's functions along with its priorities, its desires, perceptions, etc. It's not good. This is why I get this question a lot, especially after the last pornography video, which is, well, what about hentai? What about pictures?
Cheers. And it's like, dude, get a hold of yourself, man. Like, stop finding ways to give yourself permission. It's literally the equivalent of, well, I won't drink pop, but I'll eat chips. I won't pop. <laughs> uh, Midwesterners. Uh, what about hentai? If you want to, if you guys want to watch hentai, I don't care. Play slots, but I'll play roulette. It's like, it's all the same. Your brain doesn't know the difference. All it knows is that it wants that stimulation because that's what you've conditioned it to want. And now that you know the conscious difference, your brain is literally trying to make you like give it that stimulation by having you convince yourself that it's okay. It's not the same. Yes, it is. Get a hold of yourself, dude. Dudes be talking about big government will never control me, but they can't go two weeks without watching cartoons have sex. Get a hold of yourself. Your purpose is greater than that. And I think we said this earlier, but I'll say it again. There are two. Your purpose is greater than that. But what if you can meet your purpose and also jack off to to tentacles with milkies? You know what I'm saying? Like, like I don't know. What, like, how, what if you could do both? Hmm? Hmm? <laughs> types of people who watch pornography people who are addicted and people who aren't addicted yet the majority of people in the former category don't even know that they're he uses a lot of christian language he's a christian addicted which is what's so pernicious about it people just need to be honest with themselves but i do understand that it's significantly more difficult given that your brain has rewired itself to pursue that addiction so again there's no shame in this but now that you know now that you have this information it's time to change we'll go over some ways to do that in a second but a few more things that i want to mention first uh tomorrow we're going to read comments on this video as well we're going to do a whole thing on comments um, one of which being that the last line of defense for many degenerate pseudoscientists is there it is Woo! another degenerate we're up to seven boys seven of them holy shit to play chicken versus egg to basically be like well anyone who has a porn problem only has it because of pre-existing conditions they were already depressed they already had trauma etc and sure some people have pre-existing conditions but addiction will never manifest unless someone has engaged in chronic overstimulation also there's no research to suggest that young what no no, no. You can, what? You can be addicted to things you don't actively engage with. Crack babies exist. I, mean, I guess maybe he would argue that the chronic overstimulation is forced and through the mother, I guess? Sure, maybe. People without those conditions can participate can't in that. Get a, can't get addicted unless you're addicted. True. Chronic overstimulation without developing symptoms. And we have to keep in mind that the best data for these types of things is going to be hard to find because it's going to require- it's like a bootstrap paradox of addiction. Time that is very rare because it's a relatively young problem and also controls that are very rare because the problem has already become so widespread. But there was a longitudinal study done in California that tracked young internet users over time and it found that young people who are initially free of mental health problems but use the internet pathologically develop depression two and a half times more often. There was another one done in China which would be impossible to duplicate here. They found that of 2,000 new students who had never had internet access before, 59 of them had developed an addiction um, already over the course of a year. It made them more depressed, more anxious, more hostile, more psychotic. And it was because of the addiction that those things happened to them. Wait, of of a thousand, wait, did they, did you say 2,000 students that had never seen porn before, 59 uh, did, had an addiction after being exposed to the internet? That doesn't seem to support his problem of, or his, his thesis of 85%. Okay, interesting. Hmm. Hmm. Huh. Huh. Is that 3%? <laughs> And the researchers or is that 0.3%. I also said that they do, couldn't find the a solid pathological head. predictor for the internet addiction, but rather that the addiction would predict the pathologies that we just mentioned. And you might be thinking like, oh, 59, that's not even that bad. Sure, but that's after one year, after having basically grown up without it. Imagine growing up with it, using it every day, then finding out about pornography at an even younger age than that, and then they find out about the internet. I, 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 imagine if we... No, he said 2000. I, imagine if we, you know changed the parameters of the study altogether. Imagine if we just changed it and sort of just asked our gut how it felt about, <laughs> about these things. Fucking dumb, bro. Fucking dumb, bro. It's like it hijacks the most powerful circuitry in your brain, etc. It's a huge problem. We can expect all the implications of the internet addiction to translate to pornography addiction. There was also a Taiwanese study which found a correlation between teen suicide attempts and contemplation and internet addiction, even when controlling for things like depression, self-esteem, family support, and demographics. There's also more research from China that shows that while these addicts exhibit definite signs of depression, such as loss of interest, aggressive behavior, depressive mood, feelings of guilt, etc., that they showed little evidence of these being permanent, which suggests that their symptoms are stemming from uh, their addiction rather than some underlying pre-existing condition. And okay. there was another Chinese study done on a few thousand preteens that found that those who became addicted exhibited increased depression and hostility when compared with the non-addicted group, and also that those who began as addicts but were no longer addicted by the end of the year show decreased depression, hostility, just internet addiction. Okay. And social anxiety when compared with those still addicted, etc., etc. There are mountains of data backing this up. Even th so a lot of that has to do with. <sighs> 
Um, not the uh, thanks SSJ Tony um, for following. Uh, a lot of that has to do with stimulation, um, and not the um, and not the actual like like a sexual release or anything like that. Um, you can see this in in kids that have um, and you may experience this yourself if you're in your twenties um, when you grew up with that sort of internet technology stuff. Do you find yourself needing? Um, very often to have like your phone up, uh, maybe you have a podcast also, maybe you have a laptop, maybe you have a tablet or something going off and you're also playing a video game and you're watching a stream on something, <coughs> excuse me, like you're often doing multiple things at once. Uh, this is a stimulation issue, uh, not because of like, I mean, everything is like on the internet now. It's, it's just more of, it's just more of a situation where, we have a certain amount of information we're used to getting, and if we don't get that at a certain point, it's less addiction and just, like, conditioned, I suppose. Um, like, there's a lot of people who get who get anxious if we're not, if you're not, like, understanding, like, the news or something like that. This is normal. This is normal, and it's part of the thing that, yeah, literally what we're doing now. Uh, there, there's there's an aspect of of living in the technological age, uh, like the, the, the phenomenon of FOMO. That's real. Um, the phenomenon, which I don't really fall into a ton. It happens from time to time, but... Um, uh, the, the, I, the idea of, of feeling uh, anxious, but... Another thing is, and I don't think this, these studies account for it because they're done by boomers uh, and they don't actually understand. Um, a big reason that people get really, really upset when you take their internet away after they have it is, and this is going to be no shock to you when I say this out loud, um, most people's really good friends are on the internet. You're literally disconnecting them from people they love. Like, to some extent. That would be romantic love. It could be platonic friendly love. But, like... Imagine just losing access to the people you talk to every day. Of course you're going to feel depressed. Of course you're going to feel anxious. Of course you're going to be upset about that in general. I mean, yeah, if I lost access to the internet, I would lose a big sect of my social circle pretty quickly. And that would be painful from a psychological standpoint, not because I need constant stimulus, although I'm sure I need more stimulus than someone from the 1800s uh, to not feel the boredom. Um, but... That's just a that's just a, sort of a, a a side effect of living in a situation where we have a lot of information. It's 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 pretty much it's pretty much just just like like the human people that we interact with that we don't have close proximity to that draw us back to the internet. Most of your internet usage is probably social in nature. Let's be honest, right? It's it's probably not just porn. Sure, you might drop some drop by Pornville every once in a while. You might order food. You might go shopping. You might do other things. It's mostly social, and and there, he's not taking into account, and neither of these studies take into account, at least not in the way he's presenting them. They might take into account like the social nature of how the internet is used, and and how frustrating it can be when the internet goes down. I made a joke the other day on Twitter uh, that I was on LTE and my internet had gone down. And I thought about walking into the blizzard and dying. Um, it was a joke and I didn't actually get depressed or anything about it. But if I had gone like multiple days without it, I would have actually felt anxiety about being disconnected from people that I need to talk to. Right. So, yeah. Yeah. I spend my time streaming or, or, or playing an MMO. You called me out. Yeah, exactly. These are social uh, activities. Yeah. It's mostly, it's mostly social for, by most people's standards. Yeah. Things like data from Belgium that found that as 14-year-old boys watch pornography, their academic performance declines six months later. The point of all of it being that we know that the internet makes you addicted and depressed. So from there, we can extrapolate given everything that we've... No, the, the internet doesn't make you depressed. Having some the connections the internet gives you and then taking them away makes you depressed. We've talked about everything that we've learned, everything that we already knew, to say that pornography will end up being regarded as even more destructive and damaging and addictive once people start being more honest, basically, which will probably not happen because they benefit from you being addicted to it. But we'll get into that later because right now, we're talking about symptoms and how your life will get better when you stop doing things to destroy yourself. Okay. And I want to highlight that. I want to... Mm, Symptoms like erectile dysfunction, social anxiety problems, concentrating, depression, while they're all different, they do share something in common in the literature, which is the brain changes due to sensitization and desensitization. Mm -hmm. And evidence of this has been found in even moderate pornography users. The fact of the matter is that dopamine signaling is very important. And declines in that signaling have been linked to diminished sexual behavior, uh, including sluggish erections and climaxes, decreased risk. Sluggish erections. <laughs> 
sluggish erections and climaxes. <laughs> look, hey, look, hey, if you take a little bit more to get going, you're valid, all right? Don't fucking, don't fucking be sad about that. In fact, that might be a good thing for some people. Some people... You know, uh, you want to. Some people have a problem with stamina, and that's okay. Um, some people have the other, the the opposite problem. They can't get off. Uh, it's almost as if it's not associated with porn at all, John. Strange that is. Slug dicks are about sluggish erections make more sense than sluggish climaxes. Like, is it just like, bleh, bleh, and it just sort of like with no pressure behind it. I thought that was a prostate issue, really. I'd argue the opposite of what John is saying here. I have depression, and I often find that if I get depressed, I seek out the internet because I'm sad. Uh, I'm sad to talk to other people rather than the other way around. Exactly, of course. Uh, I agree with you, Mitchell. Um, I think I think most people use the internet when they are feeling depressed um, to to mitigate that. You know what I'm saying? Prostate, who called my name? God damn it, Evotion. Aching and increased anxiety combined with a tendency towards angry overreaction, which can altogether or even separately make Yeah, it does sluggish does sluggish climax mean it takes a long time or that it just has no no power behind it? You know what I mean? Less willing or able to socialize, inability a to problem focus, I can don't usually have. <laughs> concentration and memory problems, lack of motivation and healthy anticipation, which can lead to apathy, procrastination, and also contribute to depression. This is just really not good for you, man. There was even a guy who let researchers deplete his dopamine using a pharmaceutical just to see what would happen, and guess what happened? The guy lost his motivation, his senses were dulled, his mood was lower, he was fatigued, he couldn't concentrate, he was anxious, he was restless, depressed, all the stuff we talked about. And researchers have measured these declines in all sorts of addicts, including internet addicts, but there's good news, boys. The good news is that when your brain properly regulates its dopamine and its related neurochemicals, you're going to have a much easier time being sexually attracted naturally, socializing, being extroverted, generally feeling like it might actually get better. This has been shown in research, uh, what is it, after just like four weeks of abstinence from pornography, people are more willing to take risks, they're more extroverted, more conscientious, more altruistic, more able to delay gratification, less neurotic. I'm not saying that we should ban pornography. Last time I said that, people got triggered. However, in he literally is saying we should ban pornography. He's done it multiple times. All of the scenarios where we save our country, pornography is banned. And lab coats will diagnose you with depression wow. because your body's reacting to things that it wasn't designed to handle. They'll give you all the feel-good pills just to make you even more numb because they don't recognize pornography used to be a bad thing. So my brothers, just remember, you're not depressed. You're a pornography addict. You don't have erectile dysfunction. You're a pornography addict. There's no shame in that. You might be depressed, though, bro. This is really irresponsible. You you might actually be clinically depressed. Please, if you if you feel depression... I, I urge you, if you have the means, to please seek out professional help for such a thing. It's, yeah, not, it's not, <laughs> you could be both an addict to porn and also actually depressed. Wow, what a fucking dumbass. The shame is not in the actions taken to get you to this state. The shame is in the inaction once you've realized how bad the state is. Stephen J. Neptune, man, thanks for the tier one, dude. I really don't want to know what John thinks we need to do to save America. I agree. It actually is. You weren't supposed to live like this. People were supposed to protect you, and they failed. And really, all we can do now is focus on making ourselves better and our society better so that two generations from now, our sons won't have to go through this, and they'll actually have a society that they can be proud of because our there won't sons. be a bunch of depressed zombies like we are. And let's just be honest. I mean, like, that's, that's basically where we're at. That's why I have a real soft spot for the boys. All right, so that's uh, we'll, we'll we'll pause it there. One oh nine fifty six, almost one ten. Um, we'll come back to this tomorrow. John John is uh, incredibly harmful, incredibly harmful uh, when it comes to this. Um, <laughs> not a good guy. Surprise, John Doyle. Not a good guy. What a bad guy. Not a good one. Um, I guess this this section is capped off by the idea that. Uh, he thinks that 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 porn usage causes depression. I would be very surprised to learn that. I would be less surprised to learn that people who experience depression uh, use porn more often to mitigate the experience of depression, uh, however they can. Um, so, yeah. Um, Anyway, that's the end of that's the end of uh, part three of John's magnum opus. I think we have part four and five next time. Uh, so hopefully you enjoyed that, and uh, we'll be back with more of that. Uh, if you are enjoying the content, smash the corn button, guys. Smash it uh, here on Twitch. We got sixteen oh nine sub points. Not too shabe. Um, our tippy top is about six hundred more than this. Uh, which was super good, and we made a big push. I didn't expect us to sit around there. Um, but uh, when I am um, not taking days off, 
we usually hover around uh, 1750 pretty regularly, which is super nice, and I'm very happy with about that, and I, and I appreciate you guys. So uh, thank you for that. If you haven't followed, totally free on Twitch to follow. If you've been enjoying the content, please stick around. we got more of the good stuff. We don't only do John Doyle. We don't only talk about his porn addiction videos. We do other stuff. But if you're just here for the first time, hopefully you enjoy that. Uh, we do a lot of other things. And if you're on the YouTube channel, obviously, smash the subscribe button. Smash it to death. And I wouldn't hate if you told your friends.